much for being here for this important historic day. I stand before you as a witness to the reality that this country stands at an urgent inflection point. One in three Americans has an arrest or conviction record. One in three. Contact with the criminal legal system creates a permanent public record that affects nearly every aspect of a person's life. I know this for a fact. The overreach of the criminal legal system has translated into entrenched legal barriers that deny access to opportunity for millions of individuals, disproportionately people of color. These policies limit and deny the ability for a person to access economic opportunity. These laws permanently punish too many people uh, and subjugate individuals and families and whole communities to impoverished states. In all, people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system experience reduced annual earnings by an average of 52% compared with individuals who have no criminal history. Up to 75% of the people who have been incarcerated face unemployment up to one year after their release. Unemployment among people with criminal records is well over 20%. Let's put this into a dollars fact. People impacted by the criminal legal system, both those incarcerated and those convicted but not incarcerated, experience an aggregate of 372.2 billion in lost wages. It is estimated that this will cost the U.S. economy between 1 trillion and 1.5 trillion between 2019 and 2018. This is economically unstable. The system has created tens of thousands of these permanent punishments that exist today were not created by accident. They represent choices over decades that were birthed in stigma, bias, and racism, and perpetrated by fear and distrust. And they can be undone. They can be undone. Today we are here to begin the process of undoing those harms. Shirley Chisholm once said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. But my friends, I am here to tell you, we are tired of carrying chairs and waiting to be invited to other people's tables. Instead, today, we are here to announce that we are building our own table. We are here to articulate a new vision of economic opportunity and justice where all systems impacted individuals can thrive. For too long, people harmed by mass incarceration and correctional control have been furthest from resources and power to advance change. Today, we are building a movement where people impacted by the criminal legal system hold power and agency to chart the progress on their own terms. This is the work of the Just Us Coordinating Council, an inaugural policy and advocacy table comprised of directly impacted leaders across this nation. This initiative will be officially launched next month during Second Chance Month. My friends and colleagues, I could not be more proud of what this table has already accomplished. I say this because today we are releasing a first of its kind report grounded in the JCC's perspectives titled, Building the Table, Advancing a Sustained Federal Commitment to Ensure Economic Justice for Systems Impacted Individuals. This report lifts up solutions, lays out foundations for the necessary and essential work to alleviate the physical, emotional, and economic harms at the hands of the criminal legal system to fully heal our communities. The first order of business for the JCC and our first recommendation in this landmark report is to establish a National Economic Bill of Rights for system-impacted individuals. The first of our demands is simple and bold. We are asking our federal government to invest in us, people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system by allocating $10 billion in new resources for critical workforce, employment, and other supports that are necessary to thrive. We cannot do this work alone. Advancing this vision and advancing economic justice reforms will require a merit of partners. 
So we're grateful that you are here today. We ask that you join us in solidarity to build a world where, as the words of one of our JCC members has said, a world where I and so many others can truly belong and thrive to define and then reach our full potential, not merely live in the illusion of inclusion. A world where all people matter. Truer words could not have been spoken. Thank you for your time and your attention and support of this critical work. I would li now like to introduce inaugural JCC members, Susan Mason, Teresa Hodge, and Eric Weaver. Thank you, Deanna. My name is Susan Mason, and I am the formerly incarcerated executive director and co-founder of What's Next Washington. And I'm someone who thinks, you know, uh, if I just try hard enough that everything is going to work out. Like so many others before me, childhood trauma and the disease of addiction led me to prison. Before I went in, I was a loan officer, never having violated the trust of any employer. So when I was released in 2003, I wanted to continue in this field. What I have faced in the last 20 years since then were constant no's that caused me to start over again and again and again. But back in 2003, the refi boom was on and an employer hired me as a loan processor, even though I was still living in the halfway house. I quickly became a loan officer again and was doing well, but that ended. In 2006, Washington State passed a law requiring loan officers to be licensed, no felonies allowed. I couldn't even go back to processing. Everyone wanted the license and I was devastated. As I searched for work in my industry, trying to do something else that did not require a license, the story was always the same. No one with a conviction history need apply. I can't count how many times I have interviewed for a job been called back for second and third interviews, had my references checked, ultimately been offered the job and told that the t job was contingent on a background check. Okay, I'd say, here's what's on there. And they would say, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. But it never was. I cannot count how many times I've called my friends and family to say, I got the job, I got the job. Only to call back a week later to say that the job offer had been rescinded. If the offer wasn't rescinded, the jobs I was offered always started at lower pay rates and below my skill level. After the economy collapsed, I did find a job as a housing counselor. And because of the foreclosure crisis, I was able to use my experience in residential lending to save people's homes from foreclosure. The money wasn't great, but it was enough to live on, and I got a great deal of satisfaction doing it. As a housing counselor, I would represent people in mediation against their servicers and their servicers' attorneys. I tell you what, I was good at that job. But the housing crisis ended, and that's a good thing. Uh, but when I was laid off in 2015, man, let me tell you, I was scared. But I was hopeful. I thought that if I just kept trying, that the years themselves would be a testament to my rehabilitation and that I wouldn't be rejected anymore. I mean, it was 12 years later. So after I was laid off in July of 2015, I started looking for work thinking, surely it's been long enough. And wouldn't you know, right away, I was hired in the underwriting department of US Bank. I was given my offer letter and my start date, contingent on a background check. I knew this was coming, but I was hopeful. I told them what they'd find, and they said, it's going to be OK. But they pulled the background check, and they rescinded the offer. The woman who hired me was as upset as I was, but she explained, I could never get the certifications I needed, and that regulations and lock occupational licensing laws left her with no choice. This was, as I said, 12 years after my release. As I continued my search, many people told me that I was exactly what they were looking for and they'd invite me in for an interview. Companies wanted to hire me until they found out I had the conviction history. It got so devastating being told no that I would ask before even starting the interview process, hey, what, what's the company policy regarding the hiring of people with felony convictions? Explaining that it was a dozen years since my release and 15 years since I had committed a crime, but the answer was always the same, zero tolerance. I began to consider a career change. Clearly, my industry didn't want me. What could I do using my experience and skills? Well, I had done some political advocacy during the foreclosure crisis, so I thought, hey, I'd be a great political organizer. So I set out to change careers and started sending my resume out, and guess what? I got hired. SEIU 775, a local union in Seattle, Washington, was looking for a political organizer. I went through rounds of interviews with many other candidates, and there I stood, after all of that, one of two people chosen. I had my offer letter and my start date contingent on a background check. I told them what was on there, called right away. 
and that it had been 12 years, 15 years since my crime. I noted that I'd worked in lending and saved people's homes from foreclosure for most of those 12 years. And they said, hey, don't worry about it. And then five weeks later, on the first day of work, I sat in the lobby with the other new hire, fresh-faced kid, and they wouldn't let me go upstairs. I was told that the HR director had pulled the background check that morning and she wanted to have a conversation with me, and they sent me home. She called me that afternoon and she grilled me like I was a criminal. It was pretty shocking. And she said, look, I just can't take the chance. And I was gutted. So the shame of all of this has left me wondering, when does my sentence truly end? At what point will I have paid my debt? When will I ever stop having to go in front of unlicensed, untrained judges? And why do private citizens get to reconvict me after I've done my time? My punishment was 15 months in a federal prison cell, three years of probation, and a $30,000 fine. I was not sentenced to a lifetime of unemployment, and yet here I was, no after no after no. The same was true when I applied to rent an apartment or a home. It didn't matter that I had sta a stable job, a positive rental history, or after years of struggling, good credit. That is all negated by that criminal background check. What I had accomplished meant nothing. Imagine if all of your hard work was negated no matter what, and the years that I had been out were not a testament to my re rehabilitation, but a black mark forever. And let's be clear, today, I should be at US Bank underwriting loans or at SEIU 775 organizing workers, but I'm not. And here it is, another eight years later, later I am still crime free, like millions of others, still pushing forward. So after years of this and driven by these no's, I decided to do something about it and I co-founded What's Next Washington in 2017 because we believe that people should be allowed to re-enter society and have access to the economy. But policies keep us out. Regulatory, occupational licensing, and policies rooted in fear and misunderstanding keep people struggling for decades. We are here to do something about that today. Thank you for listening. America is the land of second chances, and when the gates of the prison open, the path ahead should lead to a better life. This statement was made by President Bush when he signed the Second Chance Act. The statement was true then, and it is true today. Good morning, my name is Teresa Hodge. I'm the President and CEO of Mission Launch. And after completing a 70-month federal prison sentence, I returned home in 2012 to create a path forward for myself and for others who too had been incarcerated. I recall sitting on my bunk like it was yesterday, dreaming of a better tomorrow. I was prepared to work hard, to prove to myself, to my family, to my community, and anyone who was willing to take a chance on me. I was going to live my best life possible I was gonna be productive. I knew it would not be easy. I took good job skills to prison. I had a supportive family and I was both hopeful and determined. So I felt I would be successful. What I did not know was how incredibly difficult it was going to be. How difficult it was gonna to be to connect to a job, to housing, to higher education, and banking, all because of my conviction. What I did not expect was to systemically be locked out of opportunity that I was otherwise qualified to access. I thought that after successfully satisfying the sentence given to me, I would be able to compete like others fairly for opportunities. And within a reasonable time, I would be judged based upon my new experiences. It took only a few short months for me to realize that the dream of reconnecting back to society to work and economic opportunities was gonna be somewhat of a nightmare to navigate. With this realization, my heart broke, not only for me, but for the thousands of women I was incarcerated with. It broke for the men and women who I had met and for those who needed some level of upskilling to secure a livable wage and to, sure, and to ensure a better path forward for themselves and their children. It was the first time I realized that going to prison or just having an arrest or a conviction record meant that you could be locked into poverty for the rest of your life. 
It is why I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to creating economic pathways of opportunities for people with records. It is also why I said yes to the Just Us Coordinating Council. Our strength is in our ability to leverage our collective power, our resources, to help the roughly 80 million Americans that are living with an arrest or conviction record. Together, we will advocate for and promote solutions that address poverty and inequality caused by, cause to the individuals, their families, the communities that are disproportionately impacted by our criminal legal system. As directly impacted individuals, we know that we must address the economic impact of incarceration. Bills and acts have passed and they have all failed because they have not in addressed the, the impact, the economic impact of incarceration. That is why we are calling for the creation and enactment of an economic bill of rights for system impacted individuals. So we can begin to address the disparities around employment and labor. It is how we will stop perpetually punishing people with arrest or conviction records and locking them into poverty. And instead provide men and women, moms and dads, our fellow neighbors with opportunity. To be clear, people with arrest or conviction, rec with a arrest or conviction records are not looking for a handout. Quite the contrary. We are realistic, we are hardworking, and we are determined. We, the members of the Just Us Coordinating Council, represent the experiences, the diversity, the pain, the hardships, but also the hope, the triumph, and the success, and more importantly, the resilience of 80 million people. We stand together calling for a new national vision one anchored in fairness and economic justice for people with arrest or conviction records. The cost of getting this wrong has both a human cost for the 80 million Americans, but it also comes with an actual cost. It is estimated that it will cost the U.S. economy between 1 trillion to 1.5 trillion between 2019 and 2018. In other words, it is physically irresponsible to maintain the status quo and to continue into the future without change. That is, why we are, that is why we are here today to not only announce the formation of the Justice Coordinating Council, but we also are here with solutions and a suggested framework. As justice impacted people, we bring a new vision of economic opportunity and justice where all system impacted individuals can thrive. We want to ensure that decisions are made about us with us. By establishing the Justice Coordinating Council, we have made it easy for you to engage with us. No longer can you say we couldn't find anyone. Those of us present today represent a small part of the body. We have directly impacted leaders across the nation. We have been heard, and today we are being supported. We have mobilized to be the go-to resource that drives policy, create holistic advancement of economic justice reform. We look forward to working with anyone who is committed to this shared vision. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Eric Weaver, a native Washingtonian. I'm the founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Returned Citizens. Um, I'm a member of the Justice Coordinating Council. I speak from experience as a previously incarcerated black man who served 22 years in prison. Um, during the course of the time while I was in prison, I, I got my GED, I got two college degrees, I got three vocational trades. So I thought I put myself in position to come home 
and, and be successful and be able to reintegrate back into society without any problems. But that was wrong. But now, 13 years later, as I look even in this audience and see some of my friends who are going through the same struggles that I went through 13 years ago, I understand about what their view of second chance is. When I think of second chance, I think about giving the opportunity to do all the things that I could have done. Second chance can't be opening the gates and letting me out to a place where all the doors of opportunity are closed. And in 35 years that I've been justice involved, little if anything has changed. The correlation between poverty, unemployment, and mass incarceration still exists forward and backwards. We go from poverty to incarceration and then from incarceration to poverty. I'm watching people come home after me 13 years having these same issues, nothing has changed. We are still denied housing, employment, and education. I see the look of fear and disappointment in my fellow justice of all peers who only want to come home and be productive citizens. The time is now. No longer will we be on the menu. We are building our own table. Decisions cannot be made for a population of people without them being the lead. We must educate, organize, and mobilize system-impacted people to be the lead for a platform advancing economic mobility, mobility and justice. Just us coordinating council. Pillars of our vision include a national declaration that recognizes that justice impacted citizens, their family, and their community have employment, labor, and economic justice interests rights that have been systematically denied. The creation and enactment of an economic bill of rights for system impacted individuals that realizes the employment, labor, and economic justice interests and rights of justice impacted citizens. Sorry. This bill of rights will ensure that people impacted by the criminal legal system, their family, and their community can thrive. Centering and supporting divorces, experience, and agency of people harmed by the criminal legal system to propose reform solutions and to reimagine criminal legal and carceral systems. Thank you. Thank you to the JCC members. We wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for the financial support, the efforts that has been received from the Justice and Mobility Fund, which is a collaboration launched by the Ford Foundation, Blue Meridian Partners, with support from Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies. To drive true systems change requires investing in the sustained leadership of people directly impacted by the criminal legal system, while standing alongside them to implement and propel reforms. The Justice and Mobility Fund has been a true and engaged partner, and we are extremely grateful for their catalytic investment that will drive historic transformation. We are also, we wouldn't be here without our partnerships with CEO and Jobs for a Future. Here to speak on behalf of those organizations is Simone Price, Director of Organizing at the Center for Employment Opportunities, and Lucretia Murphy, Vice President for Jobs for the Future and Director of the Center of Justice and Economic Advancement. Good morning. I'm Simone Price, the Director of Organizing for the Center for Employment Opportunities, or CEO, the nation's largest reentry employment provider. At CEO, we provide daily pay and training to more than 8,000 people returning from incarceration every year and support them throughout their journey into the workforce. The participants in our programs are incredibly motivated to rebegin their lives, but they face significant barriers to finding quality jobs with any potential for economic mobility. Prior to entering our program, nearly half of our participants have no prior work experience at all, and many were incarcerated during critical workforce entry years from about 18 to 24 years old. Some are also working to gain employment while having highly stigmatized convictions or multiple convictions. 
As part of our model, CEO centers the people we serve every day through our feedback culture. Only by consistently seeking feedback and relying on the expertise of the people with lived experience are we able to help them to achieve their career and financial goals. And our policy advocacy work is no different. In my role, I have the privilege of leading a program that equips and empowers the people we serve to bring their voices to our advocacy work and to engage directly with lawmakers and to partner with us to speak up or speak out against the policies that most affect their lives. This is a life-affirming experience for the budding leaders that I get to meet every day. Since historically people with convictions are precluded from the occupations and activities that would best allow them to influence the public policy process. That's why I'm even more proud to be a part of this important movement and part of the JCC with my colleague Devin Hickman for presenting just two of the 200 employees at CEO who are justice involved themselves. Over the next 10 years, federal infrastructure investments combined with a changing economy, an aging labor force, and employer demand to reach diverse workers will create millions of family sustaining jobs. The time is right right now for bold investment in the economic and social mobility of Americans who are living with a criminal conviction. Reducing the harm of incarceration, though, will take a whole government approach, starting with the federal government, to move from our current landscape of highly localized successes to a future state where everyone can access economic mobility at scale. We must first robustly invest in new and sustainable funding for reentry employment and training services for everyone. The federal government should invest in and require funding for the skills training that has been proven to produce results. Repeated evaluations show that subsidized transitional jobs improve both job and recidivism outcomes. Yet transitional jobs are an underutilized and optional tool for states. Issue guidance that prioritizes transitional jobs for reentry workforce development across opportunities that exist in DOJ, DOL, and any other agency that administers workforce funding. We should also ensure that that funding can be used to subsidize wages, not just for transitional jobs, but for pre-apprenticeship programs and on-the-job training opportunities with state and local departments and employers. Under the new infrastructure law, states could leverage workforce training allowances upwards of $400 billion in investments. But without federal leadership specifically directing departments to focus on the training and hiring of impacted people, we could miss this opportunity. Incentivize states to specifically direct their departments of corrections or transportation or other implementing agencies to train and hire justice involved people so we can leverage the hundreds of billions already appropriated. Second, we must remove the structural barriers that hinder individual progress. We can do this by addressing the flaws and implementation that exist in those programs. Consider the prohibitive nature of barriers like the high number of hours of on the job training before one can even access a license or the challenge of obtaining a diploma or GED just to enter an apprenticeship program. There's also policies like restrictive supervision conditions and justice related debt and ineligibility for many social supports that all work together to prevent formerly incarcerated peoples from getting back to work. Removing these institutional barriers will make the economy more accessible for anyone with a previous conviction. For example, while we're at it, we could fix SNAP ENT so that people don't lose access to their food and the wraparound support that they need while they begin to resume their careers. Governments can lead with a clear vision and implement these and other strategies to truly support people who are returning from incarceration. These are just some of the approaches that my colleagues have spoken to throughout the Building the Table report. Building the Table represents that we should not just consider the voices of people who are directly impacted, but that those voices have to be prioritized. The barriers returning people face are not inevitable. They are the result of systemic injustices that dismiss rehabilitation and deprioritize reintegration for formerly incarcerated people. I look forward to continuing this work with this amazing group of leaders to champion the recommendations in this report and to demonstrate that policies are better conceived and implemented when directly impacted people are at the helm. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lucretia Murphy. I'm a vice president at Jobs for the Future, and I lead our Center for Justice and Economic Advancement. And on behalf of my colleagues, Feliciana Perez and Josh Johnson, who are members of the Justice Coordinating Council, we are so honored as an organization to be part of this council and also to be here for the great launch of this amazing report. Building the Table issues a bold and very comprehensive call. It's urgent for policymakers to heed the work that they've put forward. The first is the call for significant, significant investment to make sure that we can invest in the reentry and the success at the same intensity that we invested in the harm of mass incarceration. 
This is an ongoing process, but it's one that we know will yield significant benefits for individuals and for our society. We have significantly invested, underinvested in reentry success. The first time I heard Teresa Hodge speak, she opened her TEDx talk with, we make reentry hard. It's a choice that we've made as a society. And as Deanna opened her comments, it's a choice we can unmake. And JFF shares this commitment. At Jobs for the Future, we have a longstanding commitment to economic mobility. And at the Center for Justice and Economic Advancement, we're targeting all of those resources to economic mobility for people with records. The work that we do has multiple prongs, but two especially urgent for this call. The first is that we ensure that people have access to the education and training that fits their talents and their aspirations. Our colleagues at the Center for Employment Opportunities have demonstrated the power of transitional jobs with a strategy that has comprehensive supports and subsidized wages. But we also know that it's important for people to have access to the full continuum so they can go to a pre-apprenticeship, they can go to an apprenticeship program, they can access two four-year master's doctoral degrees. We need to remove the barriers to the pathways to opportunity. But then as these amazing people have said, for them to be ready is not enough. We also have to ensure that employers are ready to hire. And so at Jobs for the Future, through the Center for Justice and Economic Advancement, we also work with employers to ensure that they are ready to change their practices. This is not just for the people who come to the door ready to take jobs and contribute to our society and our economy. It's for the employers who are missing out on significant talent because they are afraid to take a risk, a risk to hire talented workers, a risk to improve their economic standing, a risk to improve the diversity that we know will lead to better opportunities for them as an employer, but also a society. I think it's really important, the call that's in the report, for the federal government to see itself as that model employer to set the stage for both public and private corporations to follow that lead. We do believe that most effective transformation will come when people who are most directly impacted and have the expertise to lead us are at the table. If that's not possible, how astounding it is, they'll just build the table for us. At JFF, we're very happy to join that table and to ensure that the work that we do is held accountable to that standard, that those who've lived the experience have the expertise to shape the, to shape the solutions that can transform the challenges and the burdens. So we look forward to the collective impact that we can share as part of the Just Us Coordinating Council and look forward to the work of creating a more just and equitable society. We're going to move to a time of question and answers in just a moment, but before, I have another exciting announcement to make today. You've heard a lot today about the new Just Us Coordinating Council, which is behind this groundbreaking report coming out today. I'm excited to announce that the Just Us Coordinating Council will officially launch at the end of April during Second Chance Month with two major events on Saturday, April 29th. We will be having a launch gathering on the West Lawn of the U.S. Capitol starting at 11 a.m. Eastern on Saturday, April 29th, with members of the JCC Steering Committee and other special guests. We're inviting all of our friends and allies, especially those from the directly impacted community from across the country, to come to D.C. and celebrate us with us on this memorial occasion as we officially put our flag in the ground to say we are no longer on anyone else's menu. We are building our table and we will invite those and set our own agenda. The launch gathering will also be live streamed. So if you're not able to attend in person, you will be able to watch online. Then that evening on September, April 29th, I mean Saturday, April 29th, we will be hosting our inaugural Freedom Ball. Our freedom has never been celebrated. Directly impacted leaders from across the country will be joining us here in D.C. to get dressed up with their sneakers on and to celebrate freedom and liberation from incarceration, but we are seeking freedom and liberation from economic disadvantages. Look for more details about the launch gathering in the morning and the Freedom Ball in that evening on the Just Us Coordinating Council website at justuscc.org and sign up 
for emails and updates so you don't miss any exciting details. We also will be announcing our new Director of National Policy next week, so many more exciting developments are as we move into April, which is Second Chance Month, and continue building momentum toward the official launch of the Just Us Coordinating Council, April 29th. Without further ado, let's move to question and answers from any of the media who are present or any media online um, that may be submitting questions. I think we shared that um, this country loses $372.2 billion in lost wages of individuals just as impacted not being employed, but it is costing the U.S. one to 1.5 trillion between 2019 and 2018. How do we sustain that economically if we're not giving people, which is up to 80 million individuals, opportunities of earning wages? Thank you for coming today, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone on Saturday, April 29th in D.C. Thank you. Good job, yeah.